It turns out that being too big to fail might not be quite the achievement it used to be. You see, banking, well, it's a faith-based industry. A regional bank over here fails, people start removing their money from all the regional banks, and soon enough, well, everyone's chasing Chase Bank. That one, well, it's too big to fail classic. And under the implicit guarantees, it's all explicit and written in the law. Now, to respond to this, the federal government has been setting up a goal line defense early on. With all that in mind, I want to take a step back and start to explain what just happened, why it happened, and the controversy around potential solutions. So, our story starts back in 2018, when I was the only comedy channel to talk about rolling back banking regulations. Link at the end for anyone curious to see what I look like with twice the hair and half the charisma. So, alright, we're back in 2018 and it is smooth sailing for the finance industry. We got one of those counters that you flip around saying, I haven't had a financial collapse in 11 years. Time to start deregulating things a bit. A concerted lobbying effort by the very same people who are now failing and wanting some little bit of cash convinced both parties that, hey, we should be rolling back some of these regulations on smaller banks. Now the basic logic was, it's prohibitively expensive for these smaller banks to be handling the same levels of bureaucracy that these larger counterparts are having to deal with. Besides, they're not too big to fail, so eh, cut them a little slack. Now with these new regulations, smaller banks were a bit freer to play fast and loose than their too big to fail counterparts. So this brings us to today where we have a bunch of regional banks that have set themselves up in such a way that some of these rolled back regulations might have raised a few red flags should they still be in place. Now the specific problem in this case was a strange thing that happened a few years ago. It was mid 2021 and a pandemic was tearing through the country while the economy was simultaneously hitting all time highs. Nothing strange about that. Now there was a problem for the banks at this time, a really good problem. What are we going to do with all this cash? You see, when bribing Congress, regional banks did not splurge for the premium package. There were still Dodd-Frank era reserve requirements in place. Ok, so you can lend this much money out to people, you have to hold this much money in cash, and you can hold around this much money in cash like assets to earn a little interest, not too much but a little. Now the problem in today's story was these cash like assets. You see, legislation on the books currently prohibits buying stocks and risky assets with depositor money. Instead, you gotta have cash like assets that are only covering things like super safe stuff. I'm talking government bonds, also known as government debt. It's pretty much exclusively for that category. And you could have guessed that the government would use laws to carve out a certain percentage of bank assets that have to be lent to them. Hey, I, I know myself pretty well and I'm good for it. Just, just you know, look the other way on some of these debt ceiling debates. Now, government bonds are at the core of this problem, so I'm going to take a little extra time to explain them as simply as possible. Alright, so you're a government and you need money now, and you are not going to raise taxes to get it. So what's a government to do? Well, one thing you could do is induce private investors to give you some of that money. Now the basic pitch is, okay, give me $10 now and I'll give you $11 10 years out. Now this next sentence is crucial to understanding why everything just exploded. So these bonds and regulations are considered cash like assets because, you know, should at any point between now and that payout 10 years down the road, you need a little bit of cash, well, you should be able to sell those bonds for I don't know, maybe $10.50, halfway between that $10 you paid and the $11 that you're guaranteed as a payout. $10.50. You get a little bit of profit and you're able to pay back depositors requesting sums of money because you sold that bond on the open market, giving you a little bit of cash. So going back to our banks, you have your cash, you have your cash like assets, also known as government debt, and you have loans like mortgages and things like that. 2023 hits and all of a sudden everything changes. Suddenly interest rates are up and that's going to be a huge problem for every bank that bought a bunch of cash like assets. You see all of a sudden the government was saying, 
All right, you give us $10 now, and we'll give you $12 in 10 years. Wait, wait this just in, Jerome Powell raised interest rates again. We'll give you $13 in 10 years. And then that future promise of $11 was suddenly looking a little bit worse for wear. Now this on its own wouldn't spell a crisis, you see, you hold on to those assets until they mature and what do you know, you're going to get paid the promise $11. Not great, but better than nothing. A problem would only start to emerge should you run out of cash on hand and have to start selling these cash like assets on the open market to raise more money that you need to pay back to depositors. I think you know what's going to happen next. People started to catch a whiff of these not too big to fail banks sitting on bare minimum amounts of cash mandated by the government and a whole bunch of cash like assets that had just dropped significantly in value. I'm talking about a quarter of the value lost in months. Now this led to bank runs that forced regional banks to not only burn through all their cash on hand, but additionally have to start selling through some of their bonds at substantial losses. All right, $11 in 10 years, and you bought it a few months ago for $10? Well, now if I buy $10 of a fresh bond from the government, I can get $13 in 10 years. Let's just shift things down a little bit. So you're offering 11 future dollars? Yeah, I'm now only going to give you $8 for that. Oh, I'm sorry. Now, the government was watching these bank runs with fear in their eyes for two specific reasons. First, Again, remember, banking is a faith-based institution. If people lose faith and start pulling out their money, there is nothing left for the last guy. We can either pay a little bit now to keep the faith, or pay a lot later as people financially trample over each other to get into these protected banks. And second, whoa, 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 let's not just start dumping all our government debt onto the open market. Hey, they're still valuable, hold on to it, let's see what we pay out when they mature. Now these concerns led to a whole bunch of solutions to be proposed. First you got the classic, alright we're going to bring back Dodd-Frank regulations on smaller banks again. The specific regulation that hindsight critics point to is a rolling back of stress tests, specifically stress tests for what would happen if interest rates go up also known as testing for the exact problem that we're facing today. Now in hindsight, gee, maybe we shouldn't have rolled back the testing for the very thing that's causing today's crisis, seems pretty obvious. Now the problem some people have is that these rate hikes that led to this banking collapse were so, so extreme that they were outside of the bounds of any of these specific tests. Bonds are generally considered a very responsible investment choice, so it probably wouldn't have been flagged as something that needed to be changed. Now this is not to say that regulation is a bad idea, but rather I just want to have been watching this, I wouldn't put all my eggs into that specific basket. This solution has not yet been implemented and would require an act of congress to be implemented. Now the second solution is a full blown bailout to this bank. Basically, the government steps in, keeping regional banks solvent and fully operational. Now, they would do this by buying all these cash like assets and probably some loans for cash at current market rates. You get these assets, they get the cash. Now, this keeps bankers from dumping their holdings onto the open market or driving prices down, while at the same time yielding the government some sweet, sweet profits off of those long term assets that they just bought and are now holding onto. Now the government has opted not to implement this solution for two reasons. First, it would require an act of congress, so don't hold your breath. And second, we need to punish the banks who foolishly made the decision to lend the government money instead of holding it in cash. Now that might be a joke, but more realistically, you would want to let some of these employees and CEOs of average okay to fail banks, know that hey, if your bank's making some risky investments and playing fast and loose, well, we're going to let you fail. Now the third solution is an FDIC depositor bailout. Now this has been chosen as the solution from the executive branch. 
First, it can be implemented entirely through the executive branch, so we don't need to sit back twiddling our thumbs while Congress debates which pronouns to use for banks. They them non-binary. No, Silicon Valley Bank is definitely a dude. He him. Stop this political correctness right now. Now this is why you keep hearing politicians say we're not using taxpayer money. Yeah, if you were, you would have to call up Joe McCarthy and pass a bill. Now this strategy means that failing regional banks are going to be poof, no more. You're still failing. The people who work there are going to be out, and the people who run them will hit the road, Jack. At the same time, though, the government is going to be acquiring the assets of those regional banks, selling them on the open market, and using those sales, as well as fees collected by the FDIC, to make everyone who has a depositor at these failing banks whole, eventually. Now, this whole issue has caused a lot of smaller banks to start giving the side eye to these once reliable cash like assets. Instead, they're prioritizing actual cash on hand, leading to some sales from banks you've probably never heard of and aren't blowing up currently. Simultaneously, the Federal Reserve appears to be pushing ahead with continuing with rate hikes, which is going to put a lot of pressure on the balance sheets of banks who we haven't yet heard from and are not currently exploding, but thank you watch for tomorrow. America, if we eventually do default on our debt through debt ceiling negotiation failures, well, <sighs> buckle up buckaroos. I hope this video was kind of helped to explain what's going on with all these bank failures and all these bailout talks and exactly what we're doing, what we're thinking, what we're trying to do. Thank you and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube, I'd like to thank my patrons over here for helping me put out my videos. If you want to support independent, nonpartisan news looking into the overlooked, well, not really overlooked in this case, but you get the gist of it, join this growing list of exceptional individuals by clicking on that link in the description. Also, remember to subscribe and ring that bell so that freedom will continue to ring. Give me a thumbs up if you like what you saw. And lastly, as always, thank you for watching.